Hey guys, today we're doing passage five in the car section of the AMC sample test. Opera singer Maria Callas holds an assured place in the pantheon of great artists, but details concerning the components of her greatness are often mired in platitudes that conflate biography, public persona, and myth with her actual approach to opera. Okay, so the first thing right out of the gate, Maria Callas is an opera singer and she's in the pantheon of great artists, but... We see that word, but. So always pay attention uh, to the buts in a passage. Moreover, Callus worked in a milieu that itself has always been mercurial and difficult to evaluate. There are two principal areas in which her contributions may be examined. The circumstances of the works revived and their stylistic treatment in her interpretations. While the citation of Callus as a fountainhead for the re-familiarization of various works is not unfounded, Callus did not herself actually restore long dormant works. Indeed, even without her, there was considerable interest in unearthing early operas in Italy during the 1950s and 60s. So the author came out the gate saying Callus was a great artist, but now they're kind of going back on that and they're saying, actually... She was kind of doing like the same thing as everybody else. Like she's not fountainhead for this refamiliarization movement. She was just kind of doing what everybody else was doing. Of the revivals for which she was given credit, one, nearly none had been absent from the stage for long. Two, they were not operas that Callas herself discovered. And three, few remained in the regular repertoire without her particular genius. I don't know how the author feels, um, but I'm definitely getting like negative vibes overall. Callus's external attitude towards op opera was often frustratingly unadventurous and ill-informed. Jeez, look how strong that language is. Now I know how they feel. Not only was she content to observe so-called traditional cuts in standard operas, even in studio recordings mechanically defending their necessity in order to keep the action moving. Look, so sarcastic. But her mentors of the 1950s introduced further cuts, look at this italicized, further cuts, to which Callus never objected. He's ribbing her a new one. As for the revivals of so-called dormant operas, most editions made for Callus were eviscerated, rearranged, and even recomposed to a point that the hand of the composer was sometimes scarcely perceptible. Oh, snap. They're saying not only did Callus not invent this whole, like, refamiliarization thing, she also did it poorly. The works that she revived were unfamiliar. In addition to the removal of entire arias and scenes, the editing consisted of numerous smaller splices that ruined the look ruined the phrase structure and obscured the original character of the music the cuts never really moved the action forward as purported but radically compromised look radically so strong 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 language radically compromised the composer's style and forms yet inexplicably long and dreary sections of music were retained and callus's performance is largely untouched dang sucks to be callus right now so the author came out the gate saying callus was a great artist since then he's been roasting her basically saying she's not the only one who's doing this um, and even though she does it, she does it worse than everybody else. She completely makes the works different than they were intended to be. And she keeps these like boring, long and dreary sections of music untouched. Even more surprisingly, Callus's understanding of performance practice, as we now think of it, was quite threadbare and unstudied. If you can't tell by now, I'm highlighting the strong language because there's like so much of it. One can find many examples in Callus's studio and live broadcast recordings in which Obvious and expected unwritten cadential trills are omitted. Perhaps these errors, calling them errors, would be understandable if the tradition had been long dead, but it was not. The cadential trill was basic for all performers from the 17th century through at least 1930. One could have expected Callus, as the putative champion of dormant traditions, to inform herself better about relevant performance practice issues. Now I feel like I'm getting like a solid vibe. I'm getting the vibe that the author is like an opera a nerd maybe and they know a lot about this performance practice, whatever that means, and um, kind of the styles of opera throughout the ages and saying that she was completely taking a big dump on the style and the performance practice and um, honestly was just doing a bad job. I'm not exactly sure how she was like a very popular 
great artist in this case. It is interesting to determine what in Callis's performances continues to make her the operatic artist whose recordings outsell those of all other singers after more than 50 years, whose name is recognized by persons for whom opera is alien and whose results set the standard by which other singers are measured. That's exactly what I was saying. Like, I don't, I don't understand how she is so great if everything that the author's been saying is true. Uh, maybe he's going to explain it or she, whoever the author is. The single word that sums it up is authenticity. In historical performance circles, the word has a bad reputation, often describing performances with correct external and musicological trappings that lack musical or artistic vitality and have a sense of the academy or the museum rather than the stage. So now he's bringing it full circle and saying Callis is, is a great artist because of her authenticity. But then he goes back again and it's like, actually, authenticity is usually a bad word. It means that the, that the uh, performance is very academic and it, there's no vitality to it. So how, how are they going to wrap this up? Callis's approach to opera raised to an unparalleled peak, its most significant universal element, the complete and in her case, uncanny fusion of musical complexity and textual significance. There is no acting in Callis's work at its best. Whatever she sang feels inevitable, even when the listener is fully aware of problems with performance practice and editorial mishandling. Callis's musical insights are authentic in the most profound sense her art a transcendent probing of the music and an evocation of its inherent humanity okay so we started out Kellis is a great artist but here's you know 55 reasons why I hate her and now in the last paragraph we're saying so why is she so popular her authenticity so let's get a main idea here I'm going to start out kind of with the four corners things that I would pay attention to so the first would be the immature main idea my immature main idea would be something like, although Callis has flaws, she is a great opera singer. The arguments here are pretty sectioned off well um, based on paragraph. So an argument could be that Maria Callas holds a great place um, in the pantheon of great artists for opera. Another argument could be that she was not the only one that did these refamiliarizations. Another was that uh, these cuts that she introduced in her refamiliarizations were poorly done, I guess, and that there were these long and dreary sections that were untouched. Another was that her performance practice sucked. And then another definitely that says that the reason she was famous was because of her authenticity. The tone of this passage, I want to say something like that the author has two different opinions that they're battling with, but they really don't. Um, they have a very strong opinion that even though Maria Callas has all these things wrong with her, that, that she is still a fantastic artist for this reason. So I actually think this is a very well-studied, well-thought-out opinion piece um, and I think that the tone, I guess I would categorize as strong, well-studied, authoritative, something like that. The author's intention, obviously, Callis is already very famous, so it's not to increase you know, exposure to her name or anything like that. I think it's to give a different perspective on Callis and kind of call out some of the things that are wrong with her, but then to also like, you know, revive her at the end, I guess. If I was going to put this together as a short and sweet, just one sentence that includes all of that, I would say, regardless of poor performance practice, lack of originality and bad revivals, authenticity makes Callis a classically great artist. You can see how I've included tone when I said bad revivals, not, you know, decent revivals, not, you know, lacking. It's, they're bad. Um, poor performance practice, lack of originality, like that's not a good thing to say about an artist, but that is the vibe that the author was giving off. And so I need to include that tone in my sentence here. So question 26 says, suppose that a long dormant ballet is being revived. Based on the passage discussion of how operas were edited for Callas, one can most reasonably infer that the passage author would prefer changes to the ballet that... So this is a question asking, how does the author want revivals to go? Basically, what's the opposite of... Or like, how was he drilling into Callas about her revivals? He was saying that they uh, completely took away from what the composer was trying to do. Also included these long and boring cuts. So I think that the author would want um, the ballet revival to be very similar to how it was meant 
to be portrayed, I guess. A, make it easier to perform. No, in no way, shape, or form did the author care about how easy it was to perform. He didn't even talk about that. B, retain its original style. Totally, right? Like, that was the whole point. He was saying that Callus didn't do that. C, modify its form. No, that's what Callus did and he didn't like it. This author could be a female. I don't know why I keep saying he. D, help to keep the action moving. So when the author said keep the action moving, it was sort of in like a sarcastic way almost. Like that's what Callus was trying to do. I don't know. To me, this it feels like they're just trying to throw some words out there that we recognize in the passage. But B is answers the question here. 27 says, which of the following views is most contrary to the author's opinion regarding the largely unedited sections of music retaining Callus's performances? So first, to, to pick out something that's contrary, we need to know what the author thought. The author said that these unedited sections were long and dreary. I think it was something like that, like boring, basically. So what is contrary to that? A, they are considered beautiful by most listeners. I think, yeah, I think that's pretty contrary to what the author was saying. B, they were left unedited to highlight Callus's voice. Um, I don't think that that was ever mentioned. The, the author just said that they were boring. C says they contained some necessary editing. So the author says that these sections were largely untouched. So I would think that there is some necessary editing. I don't think that that's contrary to what the author was saying. If anything, it might be in line or it's just not really mentioned. D, they do not help keep the action moving. So I think that um, that's probably in line with what the author was saying. I think the author said that that's what Callus was trying to do by changing up the works so much, but then she left these sections that actually kind of did the opposite and they didn't keep the action moving. So definitely A here is the one that is contrary to what the author believes. 28 says, of the following passage assertions, which one is least supported by evidence or an example in the passage? So I hate this question stem. The correct way to approach it is to kind of each answer choice. Ask yourself, if you take that away, does that really hinder the main idea? If so, then it was a well-supported argument. But a lot of times you can kind of cheat these questions by counting lines. So how, how many lines of text were dedicated to this argument? And or was this argument at the beginning of a paragraph? If so, it was probably pretty well uh, supported by the rest of the paragraph. Or if it comes at the end of the paragraph, it probably was not as supported. So I'm going to encourage you to do it the first way. Say, if I take this argument away, does it really compromise the main idea? Um, but I'm not going to hate on you if you have to use some of those tips or tricks. A says Callus's performance are characterized by their authenticity. So I, like the whole like last paragraph was about that. And so I think that that's a pretty well supported argument. B, Callus's editions of some operas scarcely resembled the composer's originals. So the author actually did provide an example. Uh, let me read it. Um, it says, in addition to the removal of entire arias and scenes, the editing consisted of numerous smaller splices that ruined the phrase structure and obscured the original character of the music. The cuts never really moved the action forward as purported, but radically compromised the composer's styles and forms, but then there's still the long and dreary section. So that was like a lot of like for real examples. Like here's exactly how Callus's editions didn't resemble the originals. So that's pretty well supported. C says Callus's understanding of performance practice was quite unstudied. So that came at the beginning of a paragraph and then the rest of the paragraph, I think it's the third paragraph, was all about her performance practice and how unstudied it was and it gives examples and evidence. So that one's um, that one's pretty well supported. D, Callus was the putative champion of dormant traditions in opera. So that was, that was a sentence that it just kind of said that and it didn't give any evidence. That's going to be not a well-supported argument. Given the information presented in the third paragraph, which of the following statements could most reasonably be inferred? So what was the third paragraph? This would be a case in which I would probably go back up. It's this one right here. Even more surprisingly, okay, it's the one talking about performance practices. Um, and then it said these unexpected trills are omitted. Yeah, pretty much that, that Callus didn't have a good understanding of performance practice. And it was obvious in the way that she omitted some of the very expected trills, uh, whatever that means. A says only obvious cadential trills were left unwritten. I don't know something about this word only like that's strong language. And I don't really have enough passage evidence to make that big of an assumption. Uh, yeah, obvious cadential trills were left unwritten. Only obvious 
credential trills? I don't know about that. B, credential trills were often written in unexpected places. No, it, it, it honestly just says that she omitted them completely. It doesn't say that she put them elsewhere. C, written credential trills were often omitted by singers. So no, definitely uh, the author was saying that Callis was like the only one who did that and it was because of her poor performance practice, yada, yada, yada. It also says that the credential trill was basic for all performers from the 17th century through at least 1930. So certainly um, she was the only one doing this. D, unwritten credential trills were often expected to be sung. So yeah, and I'll show you the sentence. So it's right here, yada, 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 obvious and expected unwritten credential trills are omitted. So to say that um, unwritten credential trills were expected to be sung, that's, I feel like that's the same sentence except just saying it in a different way. So I think that definitely that's the right answer. 30 says, assume that a film adaptation of a novel has authenticity as the author claims the term is used in historical performance circles. That was the negative connotation of the word. Of the following statements about the film, which one is most likely to be true? So let's kind of remember what the author was saying about authenticity. It says, in historical performance circles, the word has a bad reputation, describing performances with correct external and musicological trappings that lack musical or artistic vitality, have a sense of the academy or their museum rather than the stage. So that's what we're looking for. A film adaptation that belongs to the museum or is is correct musicologically but lacks vitality. A says the film's plot diverges markedly from the plot in the novel. That's trying to trap you because that's something that Callis did was that, you know, her artistic renditions of older operas differed markedly from the originals, but that's not what authenticity means. B, the film uses images to reproduce the feelings expressed by the novel's prose. I don't, to me that like, like every film does that. I don't know. Like that doesn't seem like it belongs to the museum. C, the film's recreations of scenes from the novel lack emotion. So that's more in line with what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something where there's no vitality or whatever. It's just um, kind of very academically correct. So I like that one. I like C. D, the film manages to evoke a sense of humanity in the viewer. That's probably exactly opposite. So it, it sounds like the way that the author was saying his that authenticity is used in historical uh, performance circles is that it doesn't evoke emotion in you. It's just very academic. It's very like correct musicologically. It just doesn't have the vitality. So I think C is probably the best answer here. All right, guys, I hope that helped. I will see you in the next one.